How do you solve the problem of duplicate messages in a distributed system? Duplicates can happen for a number of reasons. It could be failed acknowledgements to the broker. It could be a retry from the message publisher. Nonetheless, exactly once delivery isn't really possible in a real-world system. However, exactly once processing is, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video because I'm going to show you the item potent consumer pattern. So let's take a look at this example where I have an endpoint for creating some node inside of my system. And once we've added the node to the database, we publish a node created message using Azure Service Bus. So as I said, there's a number of reasons why we could receive a duplicate message on the consumer side. First of all, on the sending side, we could fail on this line here where we send the actual message and we can try to send this message again. And let's say this time we succeed. So let's assume the first send failed because of some network failure Failure, then we could end up sending the same message to the broker twice. Then we have another possibility on the consumer side where we have the node created processor. This is our listener for the node created event. And here we send an acknowledgement back to the broker confirming that we have successfully processed this message. I have this simple consumer abstraction which contains the actual logic, but nonetheless, we're going to acknowledge this message once this completes successfully. So what could happen is we consume the message here successfully but the acknowledgement fails and we end up unlocking the message in the queue and picking it up again, which may cause us to execute the consumer twice. So those are some of the problems that we could run into. Now let's see how we're going to simulate this. So the simplest way we can achieve this is I'm going to just send the message a couple of times from my publisher side. So let's call this the message. And just for good measure, I'm going to say await send message async three times. Now, let me leave a comment. We're simulating a failure here to demonstrate item potency on the consumer side. Now, what do we need to be able to identify this message? Well, we need to set the message identifier. And a good option here is using a good because it's very random. And it gives us a high probability that this is going to be unique in the distributed system. So I have to say right away that most brokers allow you to deduplicate messages when you publish them if you can specify a unique message ID. So this already solves the problem of sending the message multiple times. So now we can focus on the consumer side and see how we can solve the problems that we run into there. If you've been working with distributed systems for some time, you know that most brokers can't really guarantee exactly once processing. And what you end up having in reality is at least once processing, where it's simply accepted that you may consume the same message twice. So what you're really concerned with is making sure that you process this message successfully exactly once, because processing it multiple times might result in some business problems. So how can we achieve this? Well, we need a way to track if we've consumed a given message or not. So let me create a simple class that's going to represent my message consumer entity. I'm going to call this the message consumer. Let's make it public and sealed. And inside of here, I need a couple of properties. You can see I'm getting a solid autocomplete here. And essentially I want to track the message ID the consumer name and when this message was consumed. I'm going to be more loose and say that the message ID can be a string. And I'm going to say that by default, this is going to be empty. And this structure gives us the ability to uniquely identify a message that we've consumed and also identify which consumer consumed this message. The reason we also need to track the consumer is because we could have multiple consumers for the same message and we want to allow all of them to complete. So then let's add this to the respective database context. I'll say model builder entity, let's specify message consumer and let's configure this entity. Now what's important here is making sure that we define the correct primary key. Now, in this case, I want to use a complex key where this is going to be an object containing my message ID and the consumer name. Now, because these are strings and most databases don't deal too well with strings, you should consider defining a maximum length for these properties. Let's say a max length for a message ID can be 100 characters. And let's say that if you're particularly creative with consumer names, we're going to constrain this to add a maximum of 200 characters for the consumer. And this can be enough to configure our entity. Now, when it comes to being performant, it also wouldn't hurt to have a unique index on these same columns. So let's specify the message ID and the consumer name. And we want to say that this is a unique index. Now there's two benefits that we are getting with a unique index. The first one is performance, being able to check if we already have a message with the given ID and the consumer is going to be fast, but also a unique constraint is going to save us from any concurrency scenario 
scenarios where we may be processing the same message twice and only one transaction will be able to store this in the database. So always remember how powerful unique constraints can be and even better if you can use them with an index. Let me define my database set and now I need to make sure that I have my database migration. So I'm going to create it quickly. I'll say add migration and let's call it add message consumers. Here's my database migration and when my application starts this is going to be automatically applied and I'll be able to use this table to implement my item potent consumer pattern. So let's go back to the message processor and let's try to understand how this actually works. This is a pretty simple implementation where I'm defining a listener using the service bus client from the respective service bus queue and when I receive a message I'm going to invoke this process message method where I'm going to deserialize the node created message and then I'll create a service scope which I'll use to resolve an iConsumer for this message type. I'm going to pass it a consume context that contains the message ID. This is important so we can implement item potency and I'm going to pass along the message as well. Once this completes, we're going to acknowledge that we've completed this to our broker. Now let's take a look at the consumer implementation to see how we can integrate our item potency check. So as you can see, we're creating some analyzed node request passing it to a method, projecting the results of this method into our tag entities, storing this in our database context, finally calling save changes. So this is what commits our transaction. This is important to keep in mind. And then we are caching the results in some distributed cache like Redis. We're not too interested in the implementation details here as they're not really relevant for what we are concerned with. So let's see how we can implement our item potency checks here. So the first thing we have to do is check if we've already processed this message. And we can do this by saying await, database context access the message consumer database set then we're going to call any async and we want to see if we have a consumer where the message id is equal to the message id on the context but we also want to compare this with the consumer name so i'll say consumer name is equal to name of and this is going to allow me to specify the name of my consumer which is the node created consumer so if this returns true it means we've processed this message and we can just do an early return from our consumer and acknowledge this message with the broker and this means we ran into a duplicate so we're not going to execute our business logic twice and cause some potential issues now this is susceptible to a race condition but we'll get back to this in a moment and what happens in our main business logic here this is the actually important part that we want to make sure is item potent and we can use our database to open a new database transaction so i'll say db context database begin transaction async i'll await this and we get back a transaction that i can store inside of my using statement now after the call to save changes i want to say await transaction commit async and this will make sure that whatever happens here is all part of the same transaction and then before persisting the changes in the database we want to record that we've processed this message and we can do this by inserting a new message consumer into our database and only then are we going to commit a transaction where two things can happen. This is the only transaction trying to process this message and everything completes successfully or we run into a failure with our database and everything is rolled back because we couldn't commit the transaction successfully. So this means that either we are going to run whatever is our business logic and also record that we process this message and this all happens together or it doesn't happen at all which means our write is atomic and this is what we want to achieve when implementing item potency the other option is we somehow have two concurrent transactions or requests that both get past this initial check here and in that case only one of them will be able to commit the transaction because of the unique constraint that we have in the database another option to solve this is using a distributed lock that you place at the start of the consumer and you want to lock for example on the message id because that's what you need and this is just going to prevent any other consumer from running the business logic now let's actually test this out and then I want to comment on a few more implementation details. So I've got my resources starting up inside of the Aspire dashboard. You can see my database, my service bus instance, Redis, and then my two APIs, which are waiting for the services to start up. Now I'll jump into Postman, where I have a request prepared, which I'm going to send to the notes API. And that is going to cause our node created message to be sent. And if you recall, we configured it to be sent three times. I'll send this request to create a new node. And we hit our breakpoint in the create node endpoint. And here I'm just going to press continue. But what's important is we're going to attempt to publish the same message three times. So I'll press continue and we immediately land in our message processor, which is going to attempt to process this message. I'll press continue and we land on the line that's going to start the consumer. And then after I press continue again, we land on our item potency check. So I'll press continue and you can see that we get past this item potency check 
and we're going to run the logic inside of a transaction and then commit everything. So I'll press continue and you can see that now we're going to send the acknowledgement back to the broker. And here's our second message being processed. We'll run the consumer again and here we can expect that after this line completes, we figure out that we've already processed this message and we're just going to return acknowledge this to the broker and we're done and then we're going to do the same again i'll press continue you can see that we're going to return here and again acknowledge the message to the broker and our transaction completes and we get back to response and we've only processed this message once so this is the core of our idempotent consumer pattern now if you have a keen eye you probably spotted some potential issues here yes we do have a unique constraint in our database which is going to solve the problem of concurrent consumers however what happens if our business business logic for some reason can't be executed in a database transaction. This could be because we are dealing with a third party API that we are calling or some other infrastructure component which simply can't be part of the same database transaction that we have in Postgres in this example. So I'm going to suggest a couple of options but I'll do that through a flow diagram that I prepared. So let me jump into my drawing board. So let's see what our options are when we receive a message. And we have our first check, if you recall from our consumer, that checks if this is a duplicate. So if this is a duplicate, then we go down this route with the early return and we end the processing. Now, the other alternative is that this is not a duplicate and we're going to begin our database transaction. We're going to perform the work in the transaction and then we have to ask ourselves the question, is this work deterministic, meaning something that we can execute within this transaction? Then great, we just execute this work and then we get to this part here where we store the message as processed. We commit the transaction and acknowledge the message. So this is what we've already covered in our implementation. But let's consider this scenario where we have some business logic that we can't simply wrap in a database transaction. So then the next question is, does this API that we are calling, it could be a third party API, it could be a microservice that we own or another infrastructure component, does it support idempotency? If it does, we just pass along the idempotency key, which can be our message ID. And this ensures that we can run everything nicely in an idempotent way. So this is going to be this path here, where if the API call succeeds, then we store the message, we commit the transaction and we acknowledge with the broker. And if it doesn't succeed, then we just roll back everything and we can retry the message. Or if the business requirements are different we can decide that we don't want to retry the message and then we just acknowledge with the broker and we're on with our lives. So this is largely going to depend on what you're doing. A simple example I can give you is sending an email. Is it a problem if we send this email? Is it a problem if we fail? And what happens if we send the email twice? So you can think of this as an example of a third party API. And then let's consider this option where the API doesn't support idempotency. Well, then what you can do is treat this like an operation that you want to store in your database. So instead of sending the email, or calling a third party API, you store that intent in the database. So let's say we write a record into our database in the email messages table, and this can be part of our database transaction. So we're simply back to this flow here where we execute the work within this transaction. We store the message, we commit the transaction, we acknowledge it with the broker. However, this path does require more work because we need some sort of background processor that's going to pick up whatever operation we stored in the database and actually process it. So we introduce some eventual consistency, we introduce more complexity, but we're still keeping this item potent. And there's one more scenario that I didn't cover in this flow diagram, and that is when your logic is naturally item potent. I'll go back to the consumer for this example. Now let's imagine that whatever we are doing here is non-destructive. If we were to execute it twice, nothing would really change in our system. So in that case, we can simply allow the system to consume the message multiple times without having to implement item potency checks, wrap it in a transaction, and increase the latency here. We can simply Simply consume the message knowing that the effects of this operation are already idempotent and we don't need to deal with the idempotent consumer pattern. Let me know in the comments what you think about the idempotent consumer pattern and how I implemented it here. The messaging service I was using is Azure Service Bus and if you want to learn more about it go ahead and watch this video next. Smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot for watching and until next time stay awesome.